Hey y'all, I'm Paul Mosley, youth pastor here at Douglasville First United Methodist Church. And this is week two of our series, Afterlife. So when I was going into fourth grade, I moved to a new town. And I'm being a, if a little more specific. I moved from a small town across the state to a metropolitan area. It was not cool to say the least. I mean, think back to when you were in fourth grade, so full of energy and awkwardness, right? Well, I was in fourth grade full of energy and awkwardness, and I was the new kid in school where it felt like everyone was born and raised together. So I was not in a good place emotionally. It took me a full year to finally form my friend group. But before I made new friends for several months, I felt uncomfortable everywhere I went outside of church. I wasn't the one who was good at sports or the one who was a good friend or the one who loved to play music. I was simply the new kid. Now you may never have moved to a new town, but you probably can relate to how I felt. I think back to when everything changed to being online, you know? There was a lot of things that made that stretch of time difficult, but maybe one of the hardest things was not really being in the same place together. I mean, was it weird being in class, but not really in class? I know I had to Zoom a lot, and sometimes I just felt invisible, just blending into the background until I had to speak. You know, all of a sudden, everyone was staring at me, waiting for me to unmute myself. It was awkward. <laughs> maybe you felt like that too. It was this, a weird feeling of being unnoticed, just like when I moved to a new school. You know, after a few weeks on Zoom, I think everyone got a little bit more comfortable, right? You know, I began to see people turn off the, their mics, and not just their mics, but their video too. And then I realized that I could do that as well. It felt like freedom, freedom for a bathroom break, to get more coffee, or to just zone out for a second. But then I wondered, you know, if I turned off my mic and video, and no one even noticed, does it even matter if I'm on this call at all? You know, I think we've all wondered that before, right? You know, does it even matter if I'm here? Does anyone care what I think? Does anyone notice what I have to say? Sure, there are times when we feel like the center of the universe, or if we're being honest, we feel like we should be the center of the universe. You know, the world should revolve around us. And if we need a ride to practice, then everyone should stop what they're doing and make sure that happens. You know, or if we're gluten-free, then our, the birthday cake at our friend's party should be gluten-free. Or if we don't like a movie, then it shouldn't be even one of the options to watch on movie night. Come on. But then there are times when we feel like nobody notices us at all. You know, maybe you've looked around at that friend's party. You know, the friend who said you just had to be there but they haven't even said a word to you yet. Or you're at that party that you just had to be at, but it feels like no one would notice if you just slipped out the back door. It may not be your friends or family. It could be your significant other. It could be your coach. It could be your teacher or a combination of all of these options. But when we don't feel like we're seen or valued by the people in our lives, it starts to make us feel like we don't matter. And whenever we feel like we're overlooked or ignored, it's easy to become discouraged or feel numb and disengaged. If nobody's listening, why bother speaking, right? And when it feels like we don't matter, it takes the passion and excitement out of our lives. We don't feel like we're thriving in life, we're just surviving, and nobody wants to feel that way, right? But it's more than that. It's possible we have a lot of people in our lives telling us that we matter. You know, parents or grandparents or coaches, and then we just don't believe them. You know, they're our parents, they're supposed to say that. Or they're our coach, they're just trying to get the best performance out of us. And so whether we hear this message a lot or 
Whether we've never heard this message at all, believing we matter is a lot harder than it looks, you know? The good news is that today we're going to talk about somebody who is very familiar with those same feelings that we've all experienced before. And what we can learn from her life can be a game changer for us. So in this series, Afterlife, we're talking about Easter, what many people would consider the biggest day ever for the followers of Jesus, because it is the day we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, when he came back from the dead. He showed the world that he conquered death and that he's bigger and better than we could have possibly imagined, right? More specifically, we're talking about the people who encountered Jesus after his resurrection and had a totally different life after they saw him. Their afterlife changed so much while they were still here on earth. So today we're going to be talking about a woman named Mary and her experience with Jesus before and after the resurrection. But before we do that, let's start with a little context. Well, the, So the Bible is a collection of books, right? And those books are divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is a collection of books before Jesus walked the earth. And then Jesus was born, and the rest is the New Testament, right? The first four books of the New Testament are the accounts of Jesus' life by four different people. In the church, we call them the Gospels. Those Gospels talk about a handful of different woman, women named Mary. Must have been a trendy name back then, like the Justins and Brittany's of the past. There is a Mary who was the mother of Jesus. And then when, we, when Jesus is dying on the cross, there are two other Marys that were mentioned as well. And one of them was named Mary Magdalene. The truth is there's a lot we do not know about Mary Magdalene. But one thing we know for sure is that she was a committed follower of Jesus. In fact, her name is mentioned more than any other woman who wasn't in Jesus's family. The gospel mentions her 12 different times. Luke tells us that she traveled with Jesus and helped support his ministry financially. He also mentions that Mary had seven demons driven out of her. Yes, that sounds crazy, but it basically means that she was an outcast before Jesus healed her. So I think we can safely say that Mary understood what it meant to be ignored and overlooked. But here's why we're talking about her today. All four Gospels record that Mary Magdalene was there when Jesus was put on the cross. Three of the four Gospels say she was there at Jesus' burial, and all four say that she was the first to see the resurrected Jesus. The disciples get a lot of credit for being Jesus' most loyal followers, but there was no other disciple around in the big moments of Easter as much as Mary was. And if you don't pay attention to what you're reading, it sounds like a bunch of women named Mary that no one can keep track of. You definitely don't get the sense that she was a major player in the story. But she was, y'all. The Gospel of John, which was written by another one of Jesus' disciples, records that while it was still dark, Mary got up and went to the tomb. But when she got there, the stone that had been placed in front of the tomb was gone. Mary didn't immediately think of, you know, of course, he's gone. Jesus is alive. I mean, no, she assumed someone had come and messed with the grave and took his body. And so she went straight to Peter and another disciple to tell them, and they ran to the tomb. And sure enough, Mary was right. The stone was gone, the body was gone, and all that was left was Jesus' burial clothes. And the other disciples left to go tell the others, but Mary stayed right where she was, in front of the tomb. And as if the sadness of losing a friend wasn't enough, now there was the added trauma of his body being taken and moved. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that he had said these things to her. So on the day, Jesus defeats death, proving God's love is bigger and stronger than anything else. He makes sure Mary was there to see it. And this was a big deal because in the first century when Jesus lived, a woman was not seen as a reliable witness. She couldn't testify in court. Her word was not trusted over a man's. And yet over and over again in the gospels, at the cross, at the tomb, and on Easter morning, it was a woman who Jesus saw first. It was who, him who recognized first and was given the job of telling others. When the rest of the world saw women as unreliable, inferior, and untrustworthy, Jesus saw something different. He valued them and elevated them, even when the rest of the world didn't. Jesus made the decision to trust Mary with his resurrection. Jesus made sure Mary knew that she had value and that her word could be trusted. You know, when the world was sending Mary one message, Jesus sent another. If Mary wondered who she could believe, the resurrection of Jesus gave Jesus all of the credibility in the world. So no matter what message other people may have given Mary, no matter what messages we may be getting because of the resurrection, we can take what Jesus says seriously. And Jesus said married matter. Think of it this way. Because of the resurrection, Mary knew that she mattered. A few Sundays ago, we celebrated something that happened 2,000 years ago, a day that changed the world forever. But on the first Easter morning, it changed the lives of the people who knew Jesus best, most of all. That morning, he spoke words that tell all of us about Mary's value and worth. In a culture where Mary would have heard again and again that she wasn't enough, she didn't have credibility, and that she should stay on the edges where she belonged, Jesus made sure the message she got from him was different. And the same is true for you and me as well. See, just like Mary mattered to Jesus, so do you. When he said her name, he said your name too. He said the names of people who feel overlooked, unseen, and forgotten. He said the names of people who feel like our part in the story doesn't matter. This Easter season, that's the message I want you to take with you. You are seen, known, loved, and important. Jesus says so. And if we wonder if we can be taken seriously, Easter Sunday is a reminder that we can. He defeated death, and we can trust what he says. And Jesus says Mary mattered, and that you matter, and the person next to you and anybody watching this video matters. When we live like that's true, our lives look different, and the lives of the people we know and interact with look different too. I want you to think about how you treat yourself and others. Ask yourself some questions, you know. Do you believe that you matter? Do you treat others like you matter? Do you treat yourself like you matter? Do you allow other people to treat you as if you don't matter? Do you treat others as if they matter? Are there people you treat like they matter more? Are there people you treat like they don't matter at all? What would it look like to start treating yourself and others like Jesus did? like they matter starting today? What would change in your life if you really believe that you mattered to God? And because of that, people around you matter as well. Would you be more confident? Would you be more intentional in your relationships? Would you care less about what other people say about you? This week, I want you to think about what could change in your life if you really believed that you matter to God. Because of the resurrection, Mary knew that she mattered and her afterlife looked different. But make sure you get this because of the resurrection, you can know you matter too. Let's pray. Hey, Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you in a world that tells us that we don't matter, that we're insignificant, that we're unseen. We thank you that we have a message and a savior and, and a, a Lord that sees us and cares about us and tells us that we matter that you came and lived and died on the cross for our sins because each one of us matter to you. God, allow us to internalize that, to, to recognize that, and to allow that to take hold in us, to truly believe that we matter to you and allow it to change the way we think of ourselves and the way we deal with others. It's in your name we pray. Amen.